I will now introduce the next person who's going to talk to you. Uh, this is Patrick Rosander, who works as a senior concept artist at Fat Shark Games. And uh, let's see if we have you here. Can you hear us? Hello, Patrick. Hi. Hi. Hello, guys. <laughs> How are you doing? Fine. Totally fine. <laughs> cool. Are you ready to... How are you guys? Yeah, I think we're fine. I can only speak for myself, but I'm good at, at least. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm going to leave the stage to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Patrick Rosander, uh, as I was presented. I'm a senior concept artist at Fat Shark Games. Um, I studied in Skövde, actually. I uh, graduated like 10 years ago, and I worked in the game industry ever since. Um, so a quick overview of this talk. Uh, it's titled 3D Concept Art for Environment Production. And it would basically be about Let's see, yeah, here we have, here we have it. So traditionally, concept art is focused on creating beautiful imagery. And I'm gonna present a process that I've come to use over the years that is a little bit different. Uh, we're gonna start the talk off with talking about 3D blocking. Uh, and then we're gonna head over to like a simulated process of how this would work in a production environment. What I'm going to show today is not uh, a fat shark game. This is important to know. This is made as an example of uh, uh, how the workflow uh, actually is used. And uh, the second part, uh, third part, I mean, of the talk, uh, we're going to go through like the speed, uh, like the speed part of the process, which will make sense in a couple of minutes. So. In today's world of concept art, 3D is becoming more and more uh, like the main focus of our workflow. The, the days of doing 2D perspective drawings and, and having that as a base for an entire game is slowly moving to the background and the use of 3D is coming more and more uh, prevalent. And in a traditional sense, uh, uh, to the concept art picture is just an image, whereas a 3D environment uh, used as concept art tells you so much more about the environment that you're working on. So traditionally, uh, when you use 3D for concept art, uh, you use a shot-based approach, which is basically you have a camera, you face it in a direction, and then you model the objects that are in view of the camera. I like to use more of a holistic approach where you actually model the entire area that you're going to concept. So instead of creating the 3D for one image, you're going to create a 3D for, for example, an entire base or an entire house, for example. So what this does is it helps us to get more information from the concept art than we would get from like a single image. And it makes sense because Games are 3D, we're going to run around an environment, so why not make the concept art 3D as well? This way of thinking came to me from watching a behind-the-scenes documentary of Prometheus, really Scott's <laughs> new alien movie, or I don't know if it can be considered an alien movie anymore. Uh, but they had a, a part of that behind-the-scenes documentary when, when they showed what they called pre-visualization in movies, which is basically a very low poly, roughly animated, kind of ugly looking version of the entire movie. But it is from start to end, every single scene, every single shot pre-visualized, which means that the set decorators know what to build, the audio people know what to expect, and the VFX companies know what to, to make in the end. And that kind of lit a fire <laughs> for me to like kind of think, how can we integrate this into game development since it's such an awesome, or it looked like such an, such an awesome way to work. So in order to make this process like port it to game development, uh, 
I realized that I needed to find some new tools in order to work with the rest of the team. So I'm going to go through three kind of tools or uh, tools in my toolkit that I use uh, to, to show the team and the stakeholders uh, the environments. This is all made in Blender. It will, of course, work in Maya or Max as well. All 3D software uh, are pretty much the same nowadays, except Blender is free. So the first one I like to use is uh, a tool called Walk and Fly mode. Let's see if we can get it playing. Yeah, it lets you basically walk around in an environment that you've modeled. So as this is done for concept art, these 3D models are not going to be mind-blowing, of course, because uh, that's the job of the talented 3D artists in your team. But they will be representative and give everyone like a more accurate vision of what the game environment and should look like. If you can compare this to a traditional just one shot piece of concept art, I hope you can see like the benefits you will get from, from this process. So the way to use this is basically you match up your field of view to the in-game camera and activate the function and you're good to go. The second tool, uh, which is extremely useful, is uh, the use of dynamic lights, like animating lights or moving lights around in the viewport. For example, if you had a scene like this and you had a spaceship going by, you can just yeah, show people how it looks even in the concept stage, not, not even in a game engine. It's very basic stuff if you're a 3D artist, but uh, the point is more to get it into the process early on before we get bogged down with in-engine stuff. The third tool, of course, is volumetrics which I feel is the lens flare of 2020 or 21. <laughs> uh, every game uses it for better or worse. And it looks awesome. And it's, it's a great tool to um, show mood in an environment. Traditionally in concept art or in, uh, in when using 3D uh, in an offline way, like rendered way, volumetrics is insanely heavy to render. It takes a lot of time, but... Uh, using Blender's new awesome real-time engine. It's actually kind of quick and, and easy to use. So these are basically the tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis to show the stakeholders, like the game director or the art director, what an environment will look like. So the main reason this process works so great is the feedback loops. In a traditional sense, you do a 2D concept and then you get it modeled, uh, you get it textured, you get it in-game, and then people can run around in it, like in the environment. And that means that the concept or the level will actually pass through the pipeline, which takes time, always takes time, before anyone can actually give real valid feedback on how does this doorway feel like? How does this, uh, how is the size of this building? Using these kind of tools, you can feed back on uh, the flow of the level through walking through the environment. You can feed back on the lighting and any other dynamic effects. And you can feed back on like even small, simple gameplay-ish uh, repercussions that the visuals might have. So the main point of this is have really tight feedback loops. And the tighter the, tighter the feedback loops, the better the game becomes in the end. So if we can iron out a lot of issues in the beginning or in the concept phase, we can basically make a better product in the end. So that was kind of the basics of, of the, the tools that we use. <clears throat> now I'm going to go through the basics of making a level. Um, this is a traditional workflow. 
of uh, how a level is made in most game studios. It will, of course, change depending on your game type and if you're live service or not, or etc. But this is a, a kind of an abstraction of how it works for us. Over the sp but the span is like years. These are the parts I'm gonna focus on today, and we're gonna go through them one by one. So when we start creating a level for for a game at Fat Shark, we start off with a kind of an initial concept that is not necessarily tied directly to a level. It can be more a mood piece for the environment in uh, as a whole. In this case, this would probably be a mood piece that details the planet and kind of how everything feels in, in, in general. We will then go on to make a more specific mood board for the level before we even do any concept, gathering references of how the sky feels, how architecture is kind of designed if we don't really, if we don't already have that. And then we'll go through like train and events and VFX. And this should be pretty standard for everyone doing this. But uh, we then move on to create a level design doc. Of course, our in-house level design docs are beasts. And uh, they are made by our incredibly talented level design team. So this is just a very <laughs> representative or abstract version for this example. But it should kind of define gameplay requirements and uh, kind of mood that is needed for the level to fit into the greater whole of the, of the game. Um, and from there, that's like we've created kind of our restrictions. I like to think of concept art as a when you start out, it's like a totally free, free land of opportunity. But then the further you go down the the like the process, the more restricted it gets. So the mood board kind of restricts our visuals, and this level design doc kind of restricts our spaces that we're gonna create. And for me, restriction is not a bad thing. It's a good thing that actually helps creativity a lot. So from this kind of uh, design doc, the level designers usually create a top-down drawing, which in this case, as you can see, is a, uh, my very beautiful illustration of a top-down drawing. It basically shows you the topology of the level. If you have uh, several engagement paths, they should be represented. Kind of the density of, of covers, the topological changes and stuff. This stuff can all be changed, of course. This is just a top-down map. And once we start building a block out, it will, it will probably change because of gameplay reasons. But nevertheless, it's, it's a good thing to have. So this is the level designer's first part. And when they're done, I take this top-down map that they've created, and I create a very rough concept model. And as you can see, in the, it's very like the first example for the walk, walk and fly mode. I model stuff that's really, really rough, more representing the shapes and uh, the feeling of the level rather than creating the most awesome crate that has been seen. Uh, and I kind of make sure that the engagement paths in this, this case feels that they feel different and like they have an identity. Um, and as you can see, working this way, if you were, uh, if you're a part of the team and you're like a stakeholder, for example, a game director and an art director, this gives you uh, kind of a awesome preview of what's what what is to be. And you could make a decision saying like, yeah, the building in the back is too small like the engagement path to the left is like weird and like we don't want rocks, we want more pipes, etc. As soon as you have something down on paper or like in 3D, you can start to feedback on it really efficiently. So when you're doing this kind of uh, 
concept model block out. There's a couple of things you really need to be aware of and, and pay attention to. The first thing is scale. Uh, what I usually do is I make a quick scene for each project uh, where I have like a chair, a table, or a cup. And that is kind of modeled to either realistic scale, like real world scale, or to the stylized version that we're using in this particular game. Uh, and if you get this wrong, if you don't get the scale correct in the beginning, you will kind of have a, a, a real problem when it comes to actually realizing this as a painting or uh, as a final level, since your buildings will be like too tall or, or too small. So this is like one of the most important steps, at least when it comes to realism. Uh, the size of doors is something that concept artists usually aren't exposed to. But if you're going to start doing kind of 3D blockouts, uh, like I've shown, here then you're gonna have to be aware like a even a first person game usually have humongous doors and the third person game will have epic doors <laughs> and if you get this wrong uh, again you will have to do a lot of redesigning since the door proportions need to be extended and etc just good to keep in mind and i also pay close attention to the contrast of uh, spaces just by moving a wall, you can create kind of a different feeling. And having a wide range of contrast, narrow spaces, wide spaces, medium spaces in a level makes the player feel like he's on a journey instead of just running through a corridor. It's the sense of progression. Also, landmarks are a very important thing to look out for. It's called a different a lot of different things in, in the industry. I chose landmarks, people call it weenies, points of interest. Uh, it's basically a place in the level that you see early on uh, that you then can use to navigate yourself around the space. And it plays into the concept of set off and pay off, where you see this object and then you run through a level and in the end, end up at this cool point of interest or landmark, and you do an action and you feel accomplished because you climbed the tower like in Far Cry 3. But it it, it works, and it, it's in, extremely important uh, in order to make a level feel like it's worth playing, actually. And it gives you an in, immense amount of satisfaction when you kind of climb the hill or like see a place and then actually can arrive to it. Since we're uh, using 3D for blocking out our levels, we can also use uh, kind of movement in the space in order to create compositions. In this example, that works a bit poorly, now I see. But uh, you can create a ramp that guides the player up towards the landmarks or to the left towards the landmark, etc. You can really work on your vista presentations or level presentations even in the concept stage since you're able to walk and run the level before you even started painting uh, of course you need to be aware of some technical limitations for example occlusion and streaming um, yeah i guess you guys uh, know kind of what it is but occlusion is making sure that the entire level isn't visible that the entirety of the level isn't visible all the time that you can actually hide geometry in order for it to, to render efficiently etc uh it's gonna it's gonna happen anyway further down the pipeline so why not plan for it in the concept stage and level streaming of course the elevators from mass effect one or classical no return drops etc in games it's a, that's an easy one. So based on my 3D concept, uh, we kind of take it into the engine and create a playable level blockout. Since gameplay is king, uh, at least in, in our game types, uh, we need to be very diligent when it comes to the fact that the, the level plays well. So in some cases, we kind of just import our uh, blockout geometry 
into the engine and play around with it. In some other cases, environment art will clean it up or make their kind of block out versions. It kind of varies, but the end result is this like the same. But we're building now a representational gameplay version of what was earlier done. Let's see. So the focus on in this stage is, of course, making sure that the gameplay metrics work, like jump heights and cover placement and kind of refining everything, making sure that it plays well. And this kind of gives us an extremely solid base as we move on through the pipeline, because we know this level is fun. Uh, so the only thing we need to worry about is the visuals. And that's the next part, uh, the concept detail pass. We basically take this uh, very rough version uh, that I made before and beef it up. Now is, now is the time to make that epic crate that you've dreamed of. Every single detail that you can cram into this painting or like this 3D model uh, is going to help the team further on. Our mission here is kind of to really refine the mood, the lighting, the details. Since the gameplay is set, like the framework is completed, as long as we don't stray outside of that framework, we can put as much love and, and awesomeness into this concept as we possibly can. Uh, and for this example, this is what we kind of end up with. It has the same kind of uh, proportions. It has the same layout when it comes to gameplay, but it's just a juiced up, jacked up version of the of the block out. And when you've done this process a couple of times, the team actually kind of knows how to see the end result. For example, this painting, they can see the end result even in the early block out. And which helps everyone just do a greater job. Uh, so in this kind of refinement stage, uh, for me as a concept artist, I really want to make sure I hit a couple of points. One of them is uh, guidance and affordances, which means if a, a player is supposed to move a specific way through the level, then it should be extremely clear which path he should take. The guidance, like, thank you, sound check. <laughs> the, like the, the road the player should travel should be extremely clear. And if you can jump uh, up or down a place, it should be extremely clear as well. Uh, and as I mentioned before, paying attention to gameplay metrics, for example, how high is the cover, uh, etc. cetera, is extremely important since now you're doing the kind of final concept work that will be put into the game. Uh, I make it a point to put in any animated areas I can because it's fun and also why not just take the concept all the way uh, as close as possible to the, to the ship product. And uh, this is a big one that uh, I, it, it, I usually forgot in the beginning of my career. It's basically adding objects that make sounds into your level concept. It can be an electrical box, it can be a fan, anything that gives the sound designer an opportunity to spice up the level and build a dynamic soundscape. They do a great job creating their soundscapes from nothing, of course, uh, but if you can help them a single bit, why not just take the extra time and do it? Uh, so I only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna speed up a bit. Uh, yeah, this last part is more about uh, how do we kind of use this concept detail pass in the pipeline. So what I'm going to go through right now is just how do you give it to environment art in a way that doesn't make them angry <laughs> and slow their work down. The first thing you need to pay attention to is having correct scale. Make sure that you work in the same metric as the environment art team. For example, meter scale instead of centimeter scale. You need to make sure you have the same uh, orientation, like the same up axis or C axis in the in the 
in your 3D software as the environment artists. And you should uh, try to deliver clean scenes. So not like uh, 50 random rotated crap objects that you just forgot in a corner. Just delete those and, and clean it up a little bit uh, for the environment artist to take over. Because in the end, uh, your, your mission is to save them work and to, to do all this kind of due diligence when it comes to blockouts and, and uh, concept art in order for them to produce the, the real game. And they're usually under a lot higher time pressure than you are as a concept artist. Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, when it came to delivering assets to the rest of the team, uh, you have to be mindful of other people's like day to day. Uh, if you can help your level artists, uh, level designers uh, workload, then you should do it like in any way possible. It's worth taking an extra hour if it's going to save an extra day for them or an, half an extra day. But in the end, you are kind of, uh, you're an expert in your field, they're experts in their field. So you should kind of trust the fact that they know what they're doing and don't kind of try to do their job for them. Because you're in the end, you are working with an expert team, hopefully. Um, so this last part is about 3D and speed, which is fitting considering I have two minutes left. Uh, if you introduce more 3D into your pipeline when you're working as a concept artist, you're going to be slower. That is kind of a fact. There's kind of no one that is quicker using 3D than 2D. The level you deliver on will be higher, but kind of the time it will take you will always be a bit slower. So it's important to be aware of the, the point of diminishing returns. Don't try to make production-ready 3D models. That's not your job. Just make a block out, make it look, look nice. You're going to paint over it anyway. Uh, but there are a couple of quick tricks that you can use to speed your workflow up even more. The first one is uh, create a kit bash library. If you're working on a game for a long time, or if you know you're going to work on a game for a long time, Take your environment artist assets, build your own assets, organize them into a library uh, that you can use later on. Do the same thing with materials. You don't have to create a new mud texture for every picture you're going to create. Uh, the same thing goes for light sources. Do a nice physically based library of light, light sources that you can use throughout your the coming years of working on, on the game project and then organize them in an asset manager so for easy access. You don't want to look through five different files in order to find what you're looking for. You want it clean and kind of accessible. If you can use any kind of physical sun and sky or like uh, sky emulation rendering instead of trying to do the lighting by hand, it's also recommended. It will save you a lot of time. And... Uh, a uh, really important part is kind of to automate your uh, path from the 3D rendering into the painting software. So for example, you can script your export from the 3D software. So it sets up a Photoshop file with uh, all your layers and depth passes and stuff. So you don't have to do that every single time. If it's a repeating action, you should automate it. That goes for kind of everything in, in game development. Okay, so to, to conclude this this talk, sorry for the last stressed bit. Early visualization uh, equals early iteration. And that gives you very short feedback loops, which in the end will lead to a better game. You need to integrate with the team properly in order to understand which problems you need to solve in order to help their day to day. And as I ironically said in the last part, speed is essential. And uh, if you're going to use more 3D, you need to step up your, your speed game, so to speak. And uh, that's it. Here's uh, some resources that I highly recommend, GDC talks and books. I think this will be shared uh, after this presentation, or I can share it in Discord. And uh, FatShark Games, uh, we are recruiting. Uh, a lot of people. So uh, go into jobs.fatsharkgames.com and uh, 
send an, an application. We want you to work for us. Okay, thank yeah, you. That's it. Thank you.